We've been essentially in post-production since week six of the shoot. We've essentially been turning over elements to um, sound effects. There's an incredible amount of sound design work that's required to develop these characters, not just visually, but how they sound. <laughs> That's been going on for several months now, and we've been turning over materials to John Williams, and we start scoring the beginning of May, and the dubbing process will continue for the whole month of May, right up to the last minute. This is the first movie I've ever done with John Williams where John did not get to see the picture before he began writing the music. This has never happened to us before. John is writing the music in a semi-vacuum. When he first sat down to watch the movie, I only had six to 12 reels complete. So he could only see six reels. So he saw 60 minutes of the movie and began writing. He never saw the last 60 minutes of the movie. But he said that there was a, he had enough of an experience in the first 60 minutes that he knew exactly how to write it. But I'll be absolutely blown away when I hear the first note because I have no preconceptions of what the music's going to be like. Except John keeps reassuring me it's going to be really different than anything he's done before. It is true that Stephen's other space epics are all very warm and welcoming in terms of the visitors. That really is... Uh, a change for him to go in War of the Worlds where you have these machines coming that bring the aliens here that are so destructive. Uh, an interesting deviation for Stephen. And so it creates a different musical opportunity and a different role for the orchestra and for the music. And there are a few s sections in there, a few cuts to the alien machines where the orchestra does a grand gesture of the classic monster film. We just sort of duff our cap to give a little referential nod to the genre. But I think, I mean, for example, the intersection scene where the alien machine first emerges is, I think, one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. And especially where we first have the bodies being evaporated, I guess you could say, by the strike of the aliens. We have orchestral gestures and sound effects, but some of them also have a women's chorus. There are women making a kind of a, a, a glissando that goes up, like almost like a shriek. The addition of something human, even though we don't exactly know that it's a, a women's chorus, gives us some feeling here that just a zap doesn't quite have. You know, so you recognize some pain in it, even though the, the victims are not privileged enough even to say, ouch, you know, they're gone before they can say that. And it happens again at the end of the fairy sequence, you know, when people are plucked out of the water. Again, the orchestra and percussion will do effects, but for one or two of them, we have also the women. Humanizing the experience, so to speak. Maybe you'll be okay. Maybe you'll get lucky and they'll train you as their pet. You know, feed you, train you how to do tricks. You should have listened! There are some male voices in some sections of the basement because we have some very interesting sound effects for the probe and also for the aliens themselves. But if you dig really deeply into that soundtrack and music track, there are men singing in that... Uh, it's even below the Russian bass. It goes into the, almost the register of Tibetan monks, you know, which is the lowest kind of pitch that our bodies are able to make. And we have a group of the men doing that very, very softly. musically with an electronically assembled group of sounds 
that I put, put on paper, I would just write it like you'd write an orchestra score, describing what I think the sounds can be. And then we would, with synthesizer, develop those sounds and put it together step by step. Only two places, the beginning, which accompanies the Morgan Freeman narration. No one would have believed in the early years of the 21st century that our world was being watched by intelligences greater than our own. And equally at the end of the film, the end of the Boston Street, and the camera proceeds along the limb of, we think, a dead tree. And one of the buds in the tree is alive, and we see that life is there. And you hear the, the cyclically closing, again, Morgan Freeman's voice, and again, the orchestra sort of morphs into electronics. For neither do men live nor die in vain. Get in with us. I'm not fooling around. I got a busy day ahead of me. Close it.